With the City Double Cash Card, you get 1% cash back when you buy and 1% as you pay. That's like the joy of getting two W's on the road. We're catching the home run ball without spilling your drink. Double boom. Double the love with the City Double Cash Card. Apply now at city.com slash double cash. Hello. Mr. Windhorse. Bright and early, Mr. Han. What's up, B? <laughs> How's it going? Hello, hello, hello. Howdy, partners. Howdy. Mr. McMahon, is there some kind of, are you like some kind of privileged American airline member or something where you can, is there some kind of like special McMahon club that I'm, you can go into where it's quiet? I'm, I don't do the, uh, whatchamacallit thingamabobber. What's that called? <laughs> The uh, that doesn't come with platinum, does it? I think you got to pay extra for that. I ain't doing all that shit. Um. <laughs> Hello. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Collective Friday edition. You know what we do. We talk about the NBA. Uh, we got a special guest this week. Not really a guest. He's not a guest. He's a member. We have a member uh, in he's Chicago, part of Illinois. He's part of the collective. Um, he's all over the... Every time I uh, read his byline, he's in a different city covering a different team. He's in Milwaukee. He's in Minneapolis. He's in Chicago. Um, the guy with the finest voice... Uh, amongst uh, all of our uh, NBA reporters, Nick Friedel. Nicholas, how are you, sir? I am good. It's good to be with you guys. I, uh, I have, uh, I've listened from afar for a while, from a while and now uh, to be in, inside the collective here a couple times has been fun. Nick, hey, is, look, a, hey, hey, kiss an ass, kiss an ass, I don't care. I just want to make <laughs> Kiss an ass will not get you off the hook, jolly old Saint Nick. I am coming for you. <laughs> um, oh, yes. Yeah. A couple things about Nick. First off, he's got a fantastic beard, and I feel like that. You, are you still rocking the beard? Because I haven't seen you recently. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. It's like I, I, I can't grow a beard. Um, uh, Mc, McMahon can grow a beard. You know, he's he's bearded. But I can't grow a beard. But Nick's beard is is phenomenal. It's a phenomenal beard. The other thing is, um, and I feel like you were ahead of the curve on both of these trends. Beard, I think you were ahead of the curve on beards. Everybody and their brother's got a beard now. But you've been growing beards probably since you were nine. And you all, he also wears pink beautifully. I mean, nobody wears pink in the NBA, I would say, like Nick Friedel. Nobody yeah, wears I pink think. in the NBA like Nick. Nick wears the best pink. <laughs> He's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's russ and i and 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 b as far as the beard goes my nickname in high school was ogre uh, yes when, when i was 12 i was about the same size that i am now uh, <laughs> so did you like dominate all the sports because you were bigger than all the other kids oh yeah i was always all-time quarterback uh i was always the center on the basketball team that was shooting threes from all over oh uh, I, I, again I, ahead of his time again exactly I, it's I a man like for he, all seasons he was mark gasol <laughs> <laughs> my uh my buddies always used to call me uh, the black hole on the floor because once i got that ball by the three point line i didn't want to go uh, make a, a post move or anything i was i was throwing up a three so absolutely i feel like i i started the trend offensively that has continued to this day congratulations i call and, you a different kind of hole <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, joining us from phoenix arizona from sky harbor international airport which is why he's going to be using the mute button a lot because even though we do this podcast every week at the exact same time he booked his flight. i mean how many freaking flights are there hey, hey bro dallas Hey man, I got to get back to Dallas for a little. I get Nikki's little Timberwolves are coming through town tonight to face the mighty two and thirteen Mavs. <laughs> um, the one, the only, Band McMahon. He's Band McMahon, Band McMahon. He's the fattest dude in all the land. He got Texas blood as thick as mud. He's Band McMahon. <laughs> McMahon. Uh, oh, and and. Yes, and the dials 
in uh, in L.A., of course. And I, I have words for you very soon here, Mr. Andrew Hahn. Uh, you just better prepare yourself. I'm um, going to be nice to Andrew the Hahn because he got up at 7 L.A. time to accommodate little old me. Yeah. Um, so last night, guys, uh, Celtics had one of the biggest wins of the season so far. Uh, McMahon, I know what this is like when you're – covering the game after it or your your work on the same night you don't always get to watch it i don't know if you got to watch it uh how much i got to watch watch stretches including down the stretch so i saw the fouls that the warriors are uh using kleenex to whine about (laughs) nothing ever goes the warriors way you know it's so unfortunate it's tough Um, it's tough i mean but when you score 88 points i mean that's a good half for the rockets but it's tough to win a game it was the rockets scored more in the game in the first half of the game you were at last night um, I was like, you know, when Chris Paul comes back, you know, you know, I, I actually thought in a weird way the Rockets benefited as a really quick aside that the Rockets benefited with Chris Paul's injury because they were probably headed for a little bit of, um, you know, some rough seas early in the season, integrating those guys. And then when um, when Russ went out or when um, when uh, Chris went out, it sort of like cleared the way for them to go back to the way they were playing last year and ended up with a great start. And I was like, you know, in, in a weird way, it kind of benefited them that Chris uh, got hurt. And, and, you know, you wanted to get him healthy anyway. Um, and so then Chris Paul comes back in his first half back. They put up 90 points. I know it was against the Suns, but <laughs> I, it By shot the that theory to hell. No, well, D'Antoni had the same theory. And he's like, you know, there's going to be some bumps and, you know, and I said, well, after the game, I said, well, what happened to the bumps? And he went, well, they'll come. But he said, it's like playing golf for the first time in a while. You know, that first round. And it's also like playing putt-putt when you play that first round because it was the Phoenix Suns. Although, hey, Greg Monroe, 20 and 11 in his son's debut. We'll see if he plays more than like five or six games in Phoenix. Um, so I actually, I actually kind of in a weird way think that the Celtics start has somewhat been benefited by the fact that they don't have to integrate Hayward and uh, and Kyrie, that they but just by handing the keys to Kyrie and letting him go and kind of play the Isaiah Thomas role to a certain it's a different type of player, but um, that has helped them. They've won a whole bunch of close games that you know because like if you look at the if you look at the Thunder for example and they're five hundred and you'd look at them and say boy they're really struggling, uh, and then you compare them like to the Rockets. Um, or to the Celtics, and you'd say, "Oh, the Thunder are, are, are really, you know, struggling uh, integrating these guys." And I'm like, "Yeah, because they're actually integrating them." You know, the, the Celtics haven't had to integrate the two stars, and the um, and the Rockets haven't had to do it. You know, um, so I just, I, I just, I've been through it. You know, with me covering the Heat and then covering the Cavs in 2014 when they were slamming these dudes together, and I just know how hard it is. And so I'll, maybe I'm just affected by that. But I actually kind of, in a weird way, think that um, short term, the Celtics have benefited a little bit by not having to worry about balancing Kyrie and Gordon out. Long term, you know, they're going to have offensive issues. But uh, what did you guys think of that uh, Celtics Warriors game last night? Here's the problem, guys. And when I watch that game and I see everything go down the way it does, <clears throat> I think to myself still, what does this really matter in the grand scheme of things? Because Golden State is so much better than everybody else. Uh, and and it's been my fear for the league, for as great of a place as the league is in, in the storylines and the younger players that are coming along and getting even better – that thought kept running through my head. We're sitting here in November. It's a fun, interesting game. But when all the chips are down, Golden State is going to dominate everybody. And, and this is just another one of 82 that they've got to get through before they, they start that trek. Yeah, but the, look, this was one that the Warriors, they got up for this. They knew the Celtics had that winning streak. It was a, a you know, this was by November regular season standards, this was a quote-unquote, big game. And look, what the Celtics have proven, I I hear what you're saying, Wendy, about not having to incorporate two stars at once, but it's not like they're putting up great offensive numbers. They are an absolutely dominant defensive team, by far the best defensive team in the NBA. And look, Steph had an off night, Clay had an off night. I understand that. Steph was coming back from a little injury, whatever. They held the freaking Golden State Warriors to 88 points. So, you're dominant defensively. That means even if you're struggling offensively, you're always going to be in games. And then they got the cojones factor originator himself, <laughs> who no longer is eating 
meat, and somehow that means something in crunch time because <laughs> Lord knows when he was chowing down steaks, all he did was hit a freaking uh, a Game 7 NBA Finals winning dagger, but whatever. So you, they got skinny Kyrie, who, whose cojones are just grande at this point, and they're dominant defensively, and that's why – what I love now is the East is interesting, and some of it's because of the young star power over there with the Greek freak and, and Porzingis, but really it's interesting because no longer can you just say, you know what, the Cavs will flip a switch, they're going to cruise through the East, and I, I still would not bet against the healthy LeBron to win the East, but man, when you've got the best defensive team in the NBA, Kyrie killing it, uh, and that whole storyline is juicy as hell too, and then the Cavs, the worst defense team in the NBA, man, I, like I said, I wouldn't bet against LeBron, but I, I, I wouldn't put my mortgage payment on them at this point either to beat the Celtics. Yeah, well, the uh, the Cavs are now, with after um, uh, getting beat by 46 the other night, the, the, the Kings are rapidly challenging the Cavs for the 30th. Um, the 30th ranking in defense. The Cavs could crawl to 29 here pretty soon. That, that's so the kind of company you want to keep. <laughs> no A team that gave up 120 whatever to the freaking Atlanta Hawks. Yeah, yeah. But, but Mr. McMahon, do you really believe? You, so you you're telling me right now that you think that Boston this year in a seven game series has a legit chance against the Cavs? I like I said, I would bet on LeBron, but legit chance, yes. Absolutely. Because, I mean, because you, we're talking about a horrific defensive team. And look, LeBron will try at some point. He's, he's in the playoffs. He won't stand with his hands on his hips while an opposing point guard drives the lane for a dunk like he did in Dallas when he was admiring Dennis Smith Jr.'s fine work and wondering why the hell Phil Jackson didn't draft him. But uh, the, the, when the Cavs try hard, maybe they can be an average defensive team. And, and the Celtics are – spectacular and it's interesting because suddenly Kyrie's like trying on defense and it ain't so bad it's interesting how that happens is Brad Stevens the Kyrie whisper <laughs> it seems well, like he's gotten through to him early in this season more so than uh, than I can remember for for anybody or well, maybe Kyrie came in with something to prove you think maybe that could be the case after he forced his way <laughs> away from LeBron and saying I don't need LeBron I don't I don't need he ain't my stepdaddy <laughs> oh, this is all fantastic. First off, uh, LeBron has become, it's already becoming, he's like a purveyor of um, commentary on rookies. Because like when he got to Charlotte the other day, the media and Charlotte was like, well, what do you think of Malik Monk? You know, what about Dwayne Bacon? You know, like, like, you know, he like. <laughs> Gave, you know, he gave his blessing to Malik Monk, and Malik Monk was all excited about it, you know, so. Um, Did he say, who the hell is Dwayne Bacon? I'm going to cook him. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, he did the same thing for Markkanen uh, when the Bulls went through ex- Cleveland. Exactly. I know. This is like becoming a thing. Um, he was talking about so, how he stayed up late to watch Arizona's games, and, and because Markkanen wore retro LeBron's, and had a nice shot. He he really appreciated uh, where he was at right now. Is Markkinen uh, got a Nike deal, or is he like is? Uh, I, I believe so. I believe so, but uh, I am not a hundred percent positive. That's the I, thing I, about hey, Dennis Smith. Didn't, yeah, he's Under Armour, and he's still down with them. Now, when Steph was crazy, no, Dennis no, Smith Dennis Smith is Dennis Smith is uh, Adidas, right? No, he's Under Armour. Oh, he's Under Armour. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, when Steph went out of his way to lavish praise on him you kind of lumped in a little and eh, maybe there's some shoe shoe love there but no by the way dennis smith jr did something that was very smart waited until after summer league to sign his deal went to summer league boosted his stock and then got paid a little bit more well, actually, yeah but some more. some people say that that deal wasn't that good so i mean so um uh so here's the thing like lebron recruited dennis smith both to nike and to um his agency clutch uh clutch sports and dennis smith did not go with either um and in the past that's been a bit of a death knell for lebron like for example uh back in 2009 um or 2008 he, he put the heavy recruiting push on to um on derrick rose because derrick rose uh, they, you know, at the time lebron was with caa and he wanted to get Derrick Rose as in a marketing client with his firm, LRMR, and they wanted to get him with Nike. And Derrick Rose didn't choose CAA, chose Adidas, and, you know, didn't go with LRMR. And so the next year, 
LeBron really went hard after John Wall. Um, uh, you know, he was flying down and going to Kentucky games and all of a sudden wearing Kentucky gear. And I was like, oh, my gosh, LeBron's a Kentucky fan. No, he was just re- trying to recruit John Wall to his agency and recruit him to Nike. And guess what happened? John Wall signed with Dan Fagan and signed with Adidas. Um, although now, or no, Reebok, Reebok, I'm sorry, Reebok. And um, now he's with LeBron's agency years later. Uh, and now everything's good with Derrick Rose. But so him praising Dennis Smith is even after Dennis Smith told him to hit the bricks um, on their recruitment efforts. Um, but LeBron always has, you know, when he praises a guy who has a different shoe, that's something. Because like I, I'll never forget Early on in LeBron's career, like eh, maybe like 2005 ish, uh, one of the freaky things happened at a. Um, I still, this is one of the top 10 things I've seen in an NBA game. Francisco Garcia, you remember that guy? Um, he, Puerto uh, Rico, I believe. That's right. right. So there was, he was playing for the Kings, and a ball got, it was playing the Cavs, and the ball got caught on the, what do you call that thing, that the flange? You know, that connects the rim to the backboard. That sounds very dirty, but go on. <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? Isn't it called the flange? You mean it got wedged between would... the backboard and the rim? No, the ball got stuck on top of that little platform. I've the never heard of a flange in my entire life. Isn't never. it called a flange? It... Andrew Hahn, is it a flange? You're on your own on this one. I think you just made right. the word up. Whatever. It got stuck on that little flat part that connects the rim to the, to the backboard. And so Francisco, Francisco Garcia went up to get it, to knock the ball off so they can continue the game. And when he landed, he sprained his ankle and missed, Oof. and missed like seven to ten days, if my memory recalls. But definitely immediately had to come out of the game uh, after spraining his ankle, getting the ball down. And after the game, somebody asked LeBron if he'd ever seen anything like that before. Because I, if I'm remembering correctly, and I could be wrong, it might have been like a turning point in the game. Like if, if Garcia went out and like the Cavs went on a run, but I, maybe that's not true. And LeBron's like, well, that's what he gets for wearing Adidas. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought that was like such a ridiculous answer. Um, but like that's his whole thing. Well, there he, was uh, the there was the time there where it was like, well, look at all these guys who wear Adidas that are getting hurt. You remember, I'm like people trying to blame Adidas for Derrick Rose's injuries, and uh, there's some other guys I don't recall who. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, getting back to the Celtics game last night, there was a moment um, at the end near the end of the game that I think sort of summarized the whole night. Um, Andre Iguodala got the ball three feet from the rim. Uh, on the right side of the rim, I mean, perfect, uh, with Kyrie Irving guarding him. And he, I mean, this is an 80, 85% score or foul situation, like maybe 90%. And Iguodala got owned by Kyrie, like he got owned by LeBron in the finals two years ago. Kyrie came up, made a defensive play, the ball didn't even get to the rim. And I think it was a tie game at that point, or at least it was a two-point game. And I was like, what the hell just happened? Um, And that's kind of the Celtics right now. Like, everybody that they put on the floor defends and is disciplined and is in the right place. And they gang rebound and they rotate and they close out to shooters and they, um, they help defend and they recover. I mean... They are playing extremely high level defensive basketball, and that's how you hold a team like the Warriors to 32 points under their scoring average, like they did. Kyrie's more than Gary credit? Payton. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> he's, he's the new age. Uh, but look, guys, how much credit does Stevens deserve for for putting these pieces in place and getting him to work like that? And how much of it is Danny Ainge, who's who's picking and trading the pieces uh, to give Stevens to make it work. Both, right? Yeah, both. And look, Stevens right now is the clear-cut front runner, early front runner for coach of the year, especially losing oh, yeah. five minutes into the season and doing what they're doing. But, man, Jalen Brown and, uh, you know, playing through tragedy last night, that that's, uh, you know, a whole different story. But just in general, Jalen Brown, what a stud. What a, an athletic monster he is and then you know jason tatum didn't play great last night but man he is smooth and you know those both of those were picks that you know nobody expected the celtics to end up with tatum you know they had the number one overall pick and 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 ainge made a smart move picked up what's going to be a 
probably a very high lottery pick in the process. And then Jalen Brown, it, you know, people were surprised. I think people ripped him for not taking uh, Chris Dunn at the time. How crazy does that sound right now? Chris Dunn, who's dominating for the Bulls right now, right, Nick? Oh. Is he in the G League? No. No, <laughs> no he's playing. He should he's be. Play- he's, he's playing. He, he he just can't shoot. And and that was kind of the knock coming in. But, oh, man, I can't. Well, Brian, well, he's the, he was the fifth pick from Minnesota a couple years ago, right? Looked fantastic in summer league. I thought he was going to be a great fit for that team because – uh, just to def- you know, it 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 started the the trigger for them to trade Rubio, right? And he was like, he fit everything that Tibbs wanted. Um, really strong, um, you know, could take the ball from people. Like uh, I remember watching him in a couple of preseason games his rookie year, and he had no idea what to do offensively. But um, I just thought he was going to be a dominating defensive player, and he just hasn't. He hasn't really done much of anything, and the and the Wolves punted on him to get Jimmy Butler, which is a good trade. But um, yeah, um, you know, I tell you what, playing point guard in this league is really hard unless you're either a freakish athlete or you know can be a at least a decent shooter. And guess what, Lonzo Ball is finding that out too. Well, you know, it's it's watching the other night, watching the Sixers play the um, the Lakers, and granted, Ben Simmons is you know a year advanced on Lonzo Ball, but neither one of those dudes can shoot. But watching but how Simmons, Simmons is a six foot ten freak athlete. Like Man. back off him, it's like back off the Greek freak. Fine. Give him a runway, give him a head of steam, and then if he gets in the lane and gets in traffic, he'll go over you and finish. Where, you know, a six six decent athlete, but not great athlete like Lonzo Ball, it's not the same thing. Chris Dunn, obviously, you know, he's he's athletic, but he's not big. You know, he's not I mean Freaking Simmons is a – he's Blake Griffin, but he's a point guard. He is a big 6'10 stud athlete. He had seven dunks against the Clippers. They're throwing him backdoor. He also missed it. He, he missed the dunk, too. It could have been eight. Dude, did you see the one, though, where he, he goes backdoor, catches a lob, throws down a reverse in traffic in a half court? I'm like, oh, my goodness. The the Sixers um, pass the ball uh, as well as any team in the league. They're super athletic. And there are times when they put five three-point shooters on the court. Not when Ben Simmons is out there, but there are times when they have five three-point shooters. And, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty and the, dynamic. And the best post scorer in the league can step out and shoot threes. Yeah. Joel Embiid uh, is, is Shaq, Akeem, Mark Gasol all, all blended into one. He's, he's yeah. an absolute monster. And by the way, you think he loves L.A.? You think he loves the stage? The, the two games he had in L.A. mixed in with, what, he had three or four nights there? Uh, can you imagine the extracurricular activities and he still had the legs to to put up 46, 15, 7, and 7? Are you kidding me? 46 points in 35 minutes, I think it was. Um, Wilt 19, sit down I think, proud. in the fourth quarter. No, yeah, they're, that's true. i got to mix Wilt in there, too, because he, he's definitely got some Wilt in him. Brian, would you, uh, would you rather, if you were going to take a franchise today, would you rather take the Celtics or the Sixers? Uh, I'd rather take the Sixers um, because the Sixers have two absolute young studs um, and they have cap space um, and they have assets. Um, but the that's Sixers not have two stud. generational stars. I mean, right. not just young studs, but like two guys who will be the best, like all time greats at their position. Yeah, uh, if Ben they Simmons. Can stay healthy, big asterisk. Of course, of course. That, that goes. That, that just. We should just call this podcast if they can stay healthy because that goes with everything. Uh, ben Simmons. Yeah, I but think you has, insist on having your name in it. <laughs> I do not. Ben Simmons um, has a chance to be uh, maybe one of the greatest rebounding guards of all time. I mean, you know, calling him a guard at six ten isn't one hundred percent fair, but he, I mean, he already the, is. He the guy's averaging ten rebounds. That's right. Uh, if you're traveling to Dallas, I'm sorry, your flight's... Is that no, you, no, Timmy? No, no, that's not, not me. I, I, got a, I got a while, boys. You ain't getting rid of There's me a- yet. How many flights to Dallas, Friedel, how many flights to Dallas do you think there are between Phoenix and, and Dallas today? So There's got to be, be 10 to 15. Okay, but number one, number one, I had to get back to the Timberwolves and, and Mavs, okay? I mean, it is an absolute must because Dirk's guarding Carl Anthony Towns tonight, and I think that's going to go real well. Number two, and actually this is actually should be number one, 
I had to get back in time to pick up my girls from from school. I mean, look, okay. I am. All right. I, I am, Good answer. I'm, running, I'm in the running for Father of the Year here. And I'm not going <laughs> to let that get screwed up by this damn podcast. <laughs> okay. All right. I love it, and I love Brian uh, with the good Wendy, answer, family Wendy. feud style. And, and Wendy, <laughs> when you need fathering answer. tips, trust me, you can you can give me a call. I got them. Oh all. boy, oh boy, it's coming <laughs> and it's coming fast. Uh, we're down to less than three weeks, less than I'm two weeks. I'm not going to make the joke that came to my mind. <laughs> um, so real, real quick before I wrap up on the Celtics, before I, I want to transition. <laughs> <laughs> just stuck, stuck in there. The best thing is everybody on this podcast is listening to it. They know exactly what Tim's about to talk because they hear right before he talks, they hear uh board now boarding flight sixteen forty five for Las Vegas. And then you hear Ben on the come. Ben on the come. Uh yeah, it's hard for you to slip stuff in when you, the background comes in. I want to wrap the Celtics up real quick before we move on to, to other things, including uh, Nick's uh, pot legalization with Carl Towns' story this week. Um, Celtics won a game in November. It was a great win. Um, yeah, there were some calls down the stretch. It didn't go the Warriors' way. Big deal. That happens. The Warriors are going to get plenty of calls. They missed the shots. They only scored 88 points. It was a great win for the Celtics. Uh, they are on a great streak right now. And... Um, they're about to leave on a three-game road trip where I think they're coming to visit you in Dallas, McMahon. Um, I, think they play, I think they play Atlanta, Dallas, and uh, Charlotte, maybe. It's three. Hey, 2010-11, the Mavs snapped a long Celtics winning streak. History could be repeating itself. Well, when the, when the streak ends, uh, I suspect it'll be just on a night when the Celtics, you know, score 81 points just because that's where their weakness is, is their offense. They just have a night where they, they can't hit anything and their defense isn't able to hold. Solomon Measure is going to swat like eight <laughs> shots and in the streak and be wagging his finger all over the place. <laughs> hey, the, the, the Hawks are red hot right now coming off their 46-point win. I mean, talk about correcting – uh, a net rating issue. Uh, the Hawks went from like one of the worst teams to like the middle of the pack in net rating with with one victory because they won by forty six. Um, anyway, uh, I saw some some people in the media uh, writing some pretty uh, bombastic statements about the uh, the Celtics uh, this morning. Um, everybody can't trust just, the damn media. <laughs> just calm down here. It's November eighteenth or whatever. Let's not make assumptions about the rest of the season. But that said, you got to take your hat off to the Celtics for picking themselves up off the canvas and playing tremendous team basketball. I mean, this is a team that I didn't know how they were going to get any rebounds, and they are a top five rebounding team. And if you watch them play, when the ball goes up, those guys sprint to that basket. Marcus uh, Smart comes rolling in from the perimeter like a bowling ball to that rim and pulls down rebounds and when and uh they, they don't leave shots unchallenged um they don't take possessions off their discipline defensively is phenomenal and they are playing together as a team and with a great system and with a great uh spirit and they are to be commended for that they are not to be crowned but they are to be commended <laughs> Nick, um, uh, you had a story this week with Carl Anthony Towns where he made a compelling case backing up David Stern's words about um, the need to legalize marijuana. Uh, and I thought what was interesting about this is that he claims, and I don't really, it doesn't, it's not really relevant. I just think it's interesting. Uh, and I'll let you talk about the story here. But he claims not to actually have, ever, he's saying he's never used marijuana or he just isn't a regular user. What is he? Uh, he said he's never used marijuana. And he has never had a drink. And and on top of that, he said that all his friends never used marijuana, never had a drink. So 
Uh, that part of it was... He must not be friends with a lot of NBA players. <laughs> I was going to say, McMahon can't make the same, uh, can't make the same statement. <laughs> hey, hey! I plead the fifth. <laughs> but it, but it was that part. But I don't drink fifths. Yeah, there you go. But, but that part was interesting because he, he's become uh, a, a spokesperson, at least on this issue, as a guy who uh, has never smoked. And, and so now I think he understands. In in part of for anybody who hadn't uh, hasn't read the story yet, part of uh, the main reason uh, that Towns uh, talked about it was he said. He's worked with a lot of autistic children. His girlfriend's uh, nephew is autistic, and he's had a lot of experience dealing with uh, autistic kids and the benefits that they have, which I didn't even know, guys, frankly, before I uh, talked to him. Uh, There's been a lot of studies that the properties from marijuana have helped autistic kids uh, use a uh, or, or or have a more normal life. Uh, And so. With all that in mind, I think he felt like this was an issue that was uh, was was close to him. And and for Towns, who just turned 22 the other day, that he's not afraid to speak out on these uh, these kind of larger hot bus button issues. So, Nick, how does the story come about? Yeah, th- this part this part was pretty interesting. This was uh, uh, like uh, j- like j- just as a little background, like because the Bulls are. Um, to put it kindly, in a rebuilding phase, you're not covering the Bulls day in and day out like you have for the last many years, and you're, you know, you're sort of spreading out. You're sort of the upper Midwest right here, going, doing some Buck stuff and and Wolves and other things. And you ended up in China. Um, yeah, I've, I've been bouncing all over. I mean, Mr. McMahon set the trend last year for this because when you have a a really bad team and and you can cover uh, a bunch of different teams. <laughs> And you'd like to stay employed, which is getting harder and harder to do. <laughs> I just thought he wanted that. to spend a lot of time in Salt Lake City and Memphis. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what I thought he wanted. It's really, hey, man, they they, they, they hardly ever let me outside the state borders. Now it's Dallas and Houston. <laughs> he says from a road trip <laughs> in, in Phoenix. Phoenix. Right. Uh, uh, okay, but so so yeah, so one of the focuses for me, knowing Tibbs and knowing Jimmy Butler and Taj Gibson, has kind of. Uh, become the Timberwolves this year. So I looked on the schedule, and the Timberwolves were playing the Warriors in Oakland. This is last week. And then they were going to Phoenix uh, on Saturday. Well, I looked at the Suns' schedule, and the Suns were playing the Magic. Uh, and on top of the fact that the Magic have, have tried Your to— Your hometown team? I, I was going to say, on top of the fact that the Magic have tried to turn things around here— and He wore his old pinstripe jersey. Yeah. When By the I, way, did, did you see Frank Vogel wipe out on the sidelines in Portland the other night? I did not. I did oh, not. my God. Just go on Twitter and, and look for it. Um, D- Damian Lillard, like, just hits this shot, and, and Vogel just, he's at the, you know, Vogel's, like, at the top of the screen, and he just he just wipes out. <laughs> he just he just goes down, like, uh, like he's on skates. Damian Lillard put Vogel on skates from 20 feet away. Where's All right, back mean? to the black hole telling us how the story came about. Yeah. Okay. They- <laughs> but so... Uh, so I saw that there were three teams and guys, I, you guys have been in, uh, are in and around the league longer than I have, but there was a Thursday last week where I went to a sun shoot around a magic shoot around and a Timberwolves practice, uh, three teams in one city at the same time. And the funny part was the heat had been there as well. Uh, so everybody loves to hang out in Phoenix for a couple extra days, but all that being said, at that more Timberwolves- specifically Scottsdale. Well, exactly, exactly. In fact, I was sitting next to Amin at the uh, Timberwolves Suns game that Minnesota then lost, and Amin and I are looking at each other, watching the Timberwolves get demolished in the the fourth quarter there. And he's like, "Scottsdale got him. <laughs> Scottsdale got him." Yeah, you, guys, you know, you know Scottsdale. who's you know who's got some good stories. You know who's got some of the good stories on the NBA is those guys who drive those uh, those. Those carts in Scottsdale, you know, in, in yes. Scottsdale, pe- yes. people drive carts around. I'll bet those dudes have been have had some NBA players in their uh, carts uh, at two in the morning. They have seen some stuff. But so uh, I say all of that because at that Thursday practice in Scottsdale or excuse me, in uh, in Timberwolves were in Tempe. Uh, I was doing a I had written down a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to ask Carl Anthony Towns uh, Q, Q&A wise. And so we talked about why he feels more comfortable speaking out on issues and uh, and, and what he thinks uh, is kind of the future for 
for what he wants to do as one of the, the, the young stars in the league who's coming into his own. And so, guys, at the end of – I mean, I, I talked to him at first there for you know probably 15 minutes. We were just – I was going through a, a few different questions. And one of the questions was, if you're Adam Silver, what one change would you make? And Carl, to his credit, I mean, <laughs> he, he thought about exactly what he wanted to say for about a minute. And, and he said that at first, which was, you know, I, I agree with David Stern on marijuana. And, 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 and but to be clear, he's not saying, hey, you know, let, let's put hookahs in, the, in every locker room and get high as hell. He, and he specifically <laughs> is talking about medical marijuana, which, look, I think NBA players, if, if they want to smoke weed, fine, especially you know, in, in Portland and Denver and places where it's legal. But he's not advocating for guys to be able to get high. He's, he's talking about the kind of medical uh, marijuana or not even marijuana, the, the stuff where the, uh, you know, the, the crap that gets you high is taken out of it. And just the just the medicinal chemicals are used. Right. The properties. And, and Timmy, to your point, he was saying, I, I don't want guys to be chimneys. You know, that was uh, that was his exact quote. And, and he's right. Like uh, he's talking about. The, the medicinal use and the medical benefits that can come uh, when when you know exactly uh, what you're taking and and, uh, and why you're doing it. So, uh, and I have to give the the Timberwolves PR staff uh, a lot of credit here because we were kind of going back and forth on a lot of different topics. And once Carl had kind of steered the conversation that way. Uh, we were standing there and we were going, you know, maybe it would be better to to continue the conversation because they were getting on the bus uh, to go back to the hotel. So the following day, uh, Carl and I talked for another 15 or 20 minutes specifically about why he felt as strongly as he did on this topic, what kind of research he had done uh, to uh, to form this opinion, and if he thought that a big difference would be made by him speaking out now. So uh, the, the the reality was I wasn't walking into my conversation with Carl Anthony Towns believing that medicinal marijuana use was going to be a big uh, conversation starter. But uh, because of, of his honesty and, and because of the fact that a lot of people are interested in the, the subject, I thought it turned into uh, a nice story that uh, wasn't planned at first. Um. You know, as someone who comes from Ohio, where there is devastating opi- uh, opioid use going mm-hmm. on right now, um, any sort of alternative medicine to uh, for pain relief, uh, even you know, uh, in the heat, that's not necessarily what Carl was talking about, but uh, any sort of other medicine that would be less addictive and potentially more natural than uh, opioids, uh, I definitely am for because I have seen uh, multiple classmates um, of mine have uh, have died from uh, you know opioid overdoses. It's 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 devastating uh, my hometown, and so when I hear something like this, and I hear like Steve Kerr talk about it last year. Um, I am definitely an encouraging of that because a lot of times what happens is uh, you get people who are recovering from something where they need pain medication, they get addicted to it, and the next thing you know, they're using fentanyl or heroin or something because it's hard to get the pills, and that's got to be part of it. So I don't want to steer this into a political conversation, but let's just say that I was receptive to what Carl was saying. Do you think, guys, by town speaking out and by Kerr saying what he said last year, uh, and of course, David Stern uh, in that uninterrupted documentary saying what he said. Do you think Adam Silver in the league office is looking at all this and saying, "Hey, you know, maybe the change has to come here soon," or, or, or do these words just not matter uh, as much to the league in the short term in, in making kind of uh, any policy change? It is insane to me that uh, this is. Uh, something that the the NBA is leading the charge on, and not the NFL. A matter of fact, when when Eugene Monroe, uh, an offensive tackle, uh, tried to really you know lobby for this and make this an issue, suddenly he couldn't find a job in the NFL, despite the fact that that he's a damn good player. And I mean, obviously, it, it is an issue in the NBA. It's an epidemic in the NFL. They pass out those pills in the NFL like they are freaking you know 
Mike and Ike's. And how many of those guys end up having serious addiction problems uh, during and after their career because of it? And it, it, it's just insane to me that the, the NBA is so far ahead on this issue uh, and, and I think much more open-minded on this issue than the NFL when pain management in the, in the NFL is a an hour-to-hour thing. Wait, but what what are they supposed to do in terms of being more accommodating when federally marijuana is still a Schedule One drug? Like they can't endorse <clears throat> right. it. It's a it's it's a it's a big time problem uh, in the country for how to adjudicate it right now because even places where it's been legalized, it's technically still against the federal law. I'm waiting for, and not just I, but people are waiting for something to come to the Supreme Court where this can be handled. I can't remember if it's on the if there's something on the Supreme Court docket this term or if there's something working its way there, but I think it's going to end up being a Supreme Court issue. But in the meantime, what the NBA can do is have a selective enforcement policy. And um, I know that that can be dangerous and you got to keep that under wraps, but that's one of the things the league can do. And for all I know, they've been doing that for a while, uh, you know, with certain situations. <laughs> Before we go, uh, I got to get to Andrew Hahn's uh, Los Angeles Clippers. Hello. Wait, is that the team with the longest losing streak in the NBA? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're number one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to make matters worse, or you know, you never know, but they start a five-game road trip tonight. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes teams go out on long road trips and they find themselves. Uh, but that said, um, they're, they're not going to find losing, anything. <laughs> um, you know, just to remind people, uh, you know, at the beginning of the season, Andrew Hahn called this. He predicted fifty-two wins. Am I correct? It keeps on going up every time you recall it. It's, it was well, well, what fifty? Yeah. I think I thought I think you like started at fifty-two, and then when I um, tiss tissed you, you dropped to fifty. Okay. Uh, okay. But, well, but, okay. Hold on, Wendy. You cannot taunt people about predictions when you don't have the cojones to make one. Okay, I'm just saying that when it was when they were four and zero. Oh, on this here pod, I, I I tipped my cap, my proverbial cap to Mr. Han. And you're going to untip and, it now? No, I'm just going to say, now what say you that they've lost seven of eight, and if this road trip goes bad, maybe it'll go well, but if it goes bad, starts in Cleveland tonight, um, that seat might get a little warm for Doc Rivers. Yeah, I mean, uh, before the season started, I would have said that Doc Rivers is probably one of the five coaches in the NBA that had there was no chance that he would get fired midseason. And like you said, if this road trip goes bad, I could see that seat getting pretty, pretty hot. Um, the other issue, I think, for the Clippers is they're going to have to make – if they continue to play poorly – and, you know, it's, we're early. You, just like you can't crown the Celtics anything or – you know, it's a, a little early. But they're – what are their five? Yeah, the, the Clippers think, were what? They were the NBA champions of uh, mid-November last year. So, right. yeah. so, so they're five and eight right now, right? I right. think they are, yes. Mr. Hahn. Um, they, play, they, play, they haven't played that many games. Some teams have played like 17 games. Um, but anyway, um, so – they're five and eight. They have a five-game road trip. Um, if they fall, you know, six, eight, ten games under five hundred by mid-December, you start getting into the realm of, well, what do you do here? This draft is loaded at the top. You know, DeAndre Jordan is a potential trade piece. If you don't, if you're gonna, you know. If the Clippers don't turn it around quickly, all of a sudden those things are going to head towards their their plate for making a decision. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, I completely agree. I think I asked you, we were having dinner in Connecticut before the season started, and I said, uh, do you think the Cavs and Clippers make uh, potential trade partners for DeAndre? You said no, but the Cavs aren't doing that well right now. Clippers clearly aren't doing that well. Uh, Maybe the two of them revisit something around DeAndre? 
Well, the Cavs. Well, there would probably have to be another horrid. team. I mean, who? Like, what can the Cavs give up? That that would because DeAndre's. I mean, even a, even DeAndre's a rental. I mean, there's there's got to be some value there. Well, it depends. You know, because he's a rent. You know, the Cavs could trade like Tristan Thompson and Jake Crowder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would be a good deal uh, for the Clippers. Um, you know, the Cavs might be willing to give their first round pick, uh, not the Nets pick, but their first round pick. And you have to include something else to make the math work. Maybe the Cavs you know, aren't going to give up a lottery pick. <laughs> Zing. Uh, you know, come on. Come on, McMahon. No lottery protected. Don't be ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that well? I mean, isn't there a. Isn't there a history there of, uh, of team, those teams trading and the picks not being lottery protected and that blowing yeah, up? Yeah, there was an unprotected uh, pick, which which was which was one of the best trades of the last decade until the Celtics started getting going. And the Celtics have, have made several moves that have knocked that Kyrie trade um, way back in the, in the who, ranks. Who was that for? Was that Baron Davis? So the Cavs took on Baron Davis, which they summarily – amnesty a year later uh-huh. uh, i mean they still had to pay him but he didn't sit on their books um and they traded mo williams and jamario moon i think for baron davis and um and the unprotected pick and then that that's Kyrie, correct at the yeah. time it was the number yeah. eight pick but i want to point out here because everyone likes to to say that that was one of the best deals if the clippers protected their own pick then they the unprotected Minnesota pick that they had for the following year would automatically go to the Cavs if somehow the Clippers got the number one pick, which they did. And that Minnesota pick the following year was highly covered. That was like the all of the Brooklyn picks these past couple of years. I just want to point that out. Okay, that was well defended, but it still was not a good trade. Um, yes, <laughs> it sort of it sort of reminds me. Do you remember when the um, when the when the Nets traded? Um, their pick uh, for for Gerald Wallace, and that pick ended up being um, Damian, Damian Lillard. Lillard. <laughs> and they oh. explained and, it. By and by the way, that's not even anywhere close to the worst trade the Nets have made in the last whatever how many years. I mean, the Nets were not going to be in the playoffs, and and or at least I mean I don't know they were trying to make the playoffs or something, but they were they were headed to be a lottery team, and they and they said they protected it top three. And I think it was top three. And they go, well, we only think there's three guys in this right. draft who are going to help us. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's it's <laughs> not a good idea to trade unprotected picks. The Billy King special? Really not a good, really not a good idea. Um, yeah, that was another Billy King move. Um, but um, so, Andrew, what do you think the outlook is for the Clippers here? Now, they're banged up. Uh, Gallinari is out, although that can't be a surprise. The guy misses 20 games a year. Um uh, and now Patrick Beverly is dealing with a knee issue, but he's had knee issues in the past. So, um, you know, what's the option? And caused knee issues in the past. That, <laughs> correct. Um, yeah, I think the outlook for them is, uh, like you said, if, if they don't figure it out by mid-December, then they probably look to pivot and see what, the, uh, what kind of return they can get for some of the assets that they have. Uh, I think that uh, it's weird to say, but... Milos Teodosic going down as early as he did was actually more harmful than people realize because they have surprisingly few uh, play creators on that roster, and it's abundant. it's almost like they used to rely on Chris Paul or something. It's almost like that. I don't. I don't. I'm not familiar with that name though, Tim. So uh, can't really <laughs> speak to that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just they have to be stunned. I mean, even though they've had the injuries. They have to be stunned that they're, well, they're eight right four now. Four games into this thing, you know, they're four and zero. Blake's looking like, oh my goodness, is this a sleeper MVP candidate? And they've won a game since then. Yeah, and um, they had no answer for <laughs> Embiid. Just destroyed oh, their dudes the other night. <laughs> Um, one more thing before we go, Nick. Um, you're in uh, in the center of this uh, Bobby Portis, Nico Miritich thing. Um, oh, I, I, I do think it's one of the you know the Bulls are awful, um, 
but I do think it's one of the more fascinating things going on in the NBA right now. The the slow, unrelenting dance between Bobby Portis and Miritich. Can you update us on what's going on there? B, it's so awkward. When you walk into practice and you see Nico Miritich riding a stationary bike and the way the Bulls practice facility is set up, they've got all their machines on one floor, weight machines and uh, you know the stationary bikes and treadmills, etc. And then you've got the practice floor below it. So Miritich is literally doing his rehab work now, watching Portis and the rest of his teammates uh, have practice. And in talking to a and he's, Robin, cl- he's cleared to practice though, right? Uh, he's cleared to he's cleared to do more right now. His, the the facial okay. fractures are still uh, but healing, he, but he could be down there on the court. He could be down there. Yeah, he could be down there. You know, I mean, they could they could look. Let's face it, they could bring a bike down to the floor, <laughs> and, right? And he could <laughs> he could get his work in there, but. Uh, it, it, uh, hey, our our old colleague Ethan Strauss talked about Draymond Green taking bikes into the sauna. So those bikes are, you know, they've got wheels on them. You can move them. Yeah, right. They they can find a way if you if you wanted to be around. But what makes it even more awkward? I, I was saying I was talking to Robin Lopez the other day, and he was saying that Miritich wants to be back around all the rest of his teammates. They went out to dinner. Uh, he and Lopez and Chris Felicio the other night, and, and they were talking about you know what's been going on. It's just that Nico Miritich flat out does not want to speak uh, to Bobby Portis. And John Paxson, the Bulls' executive VP, and uh, Fred Hoiberg, they all want him to just kind of clear the air because it's awkward for everybody now. But he he just doesn't want to do it because of what happened. So now uh, it, it, it was an apt description. It's a dance because now it becomes, all right, whenever Miritich is ready to, to play again, uh, are the Bulls <laughs> ready to to plug, plug him back on the floor when he he won't even talk to to Bobby Portis? Are they going to have to deal him? Uh, the the reality they though is they can't trade him till January fifteenth at the earliest. Right, and he's got a no trade this year. He's got a no right. trade in his deal because uh, it's a, it a two year deal with the team oh, option. Oh, uh, I I so. think he'd probably waive that no trade. Yeah, well, th- there there's no doubt. I I think the Bulls are still hoping, guys that they can come to some kind of uh, middle ground here uh, and they can find a way to, to get them in the same room and, and just talk. But up to this point, Portis has called him. He's texted him uh, to apologize. And Nico just does not want to talk to him. And, and it's lingering over everything the Bulls are doing. McMahon, right did, McMahon, did they is hate this... each other before the punch? They didn't like each other. Uh, I think for – you know, three years they've been going up and down to practice and they've been competing for the same minutes. But uh, it just that practice, when you talk to uh, players and coaches, it just it, it brewed and brewed. It, they went at it a couple different times uh, for uh, Randy Brown, one of the Bulls assistants, tried to get in the middle of it. And instead of just either ending practice or sending both guys away or sitting them down, it just brewed to the point where. They're running up the floor, and Miritich turns like he's going to do something. He doesn't swing or anything, and Bobby's like, forget that, and just clocked him and, and knocked him out. McMahon, where, give us some cojones factor rankings here. What's the cojones factor for Miritich? Is, does he score high on it for saying, forget you guys, I'm sitting over here, or does he score low on it for not getting back into practice? No, first of all, it, it, he scores like he's – None. Like they've been uh, well, castrated. Okay? Because <laughs> here's the deal. If you're going to be talking all that crap and you're, you're, you're going to like go towards the guy like you're ready to fight, you better be ready to fight. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you hey, ain't no fake. Once you once you act like you're ready to go, you better be ready to go. And if you get punched in the face and knock the bleep out, that's your damn problem. <laughs> and then you're going to act like a little baby afterwards. He earned that ass whooping is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the other day, John Paxson basically said, uh, I might have read it in your story, Nick. I don't know if you were even with him, but um, look, he's under contract. He's got to go down there and practice, right? Yeah, I mean, at some point here soon, th- there's got to be some kind of finality to this because you can't have this dance play on and on and on uh, for the next few weeks. And And guys, the other issue here is, uh, you know, I've I even had a couple people, uh, a couple executives in the league say, you know, what's the story? It's like, 
who's going to end up elsewhere, the reality, having watched both of these guys. Uh, and on a, on a personal basis, I, I think they're both good guys. I don't think either one of, the, of them are, are bad or have real bad intentions. They're, I just don't believe either of them are, are that good. Yeah, well, well, let's talk reality here because I'm glad you brought that up. Here's the reality. Nico Miritich wants Bobby Portis traded, I'm sure. You know, he, he can't be traded, right? Um, and he, uh, So in, in the absence of that, I think he would prefer that the Bulls would just trade Bobby Portis. But I'm just going to be honest. And stop me if you think I'm wrong, uh, Nick. Nico doesn't have the juice to get anybody traded. He's not a good enough player to go to management and say, uh, even the fact that he got punched out. I mean, they suspended Portis for eight games, which cost him a ton of money. How much money did that cost him? Do you remember, Nick? It was uh, a little over ten grand a game. Okay, so it cost him Bobby Marks. So it cost him in the neighborhood of a hundred grand, and, um, and and not only that, his reputation has been destroyed and his is he's been affected many ways he has paid a penalty maybe nico miritich doesn't feel like the penalty is appropriate but he has paid a penalty um nico miritich doesn't have the juice to get bobby porter's trade he's not plus good enough. plus like if it, if this thing festers what's it gonna do hurt team chemistry on a team that's gonna win freaking 13 games this year who gives a crap right and and there's timmy there's the other problem is because it seems like the rest of the team has kind of moved on now. And Brian, to your point, it's like, okay, Bobby has, has paid his penalty. He's, he sat out these games. He was still practicing uh, with the team as they were roll, rolling along through the year here in the last few weeks. But all those guys really like Bobby. Uh, the same couldn't always be said for Nico just because – I think Nico, up and down the organization, has just rubbed people the wrong way in, in how he's handled some, some situations. And uh, let, let's be real here. To, to the original point, Nico was supposed to come in and be a dominant offensive force for the Bulls. And he showed glimpses of that in the last few years, but he never showed it on a consistent basis. And so he came into the the summer uh, and word was that uh, his representatives were asking between 16 to 18 million a year they wanted a three or four year deal that never happened there wasn't much of a market for him and he had to sign a one year deal and all that frustration i think uh, has played into part of uh, the, the the way the situation has played out now let me say this about the bulls um <clears throat> Laurie Markkinen, I think, is a really good draft pick. Uh, he's had some really good games. There's a lot of people excited about his future. I don't know if he's a number one on a team, but he's got a chance. If he's your second or third best player, that you're going to be really good. Um, he looks good. Right, Nick? Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I, I think he will turn into uh, being a really solid player. Uh, seven foot, can shoot the three, NBA ready, immediately making an impact. Number two, Zach Levine, in my opinion – is a stud. Um, there were many nights over the last couple of years where Zach Levine was the best or the second best player for the Wolves and outplayed Andrew Wiggins. Now, Andrew Wiggins, um, there's a reason why they, why they, uh, they picked him. Um, there's, you know, between the two of them and all these things, you know, but Zach Levine, there were times when you wondered who was the better prospect. Okay. Now he's coming back from an ACL. Okay. You got to see all your covers from that, but you know, you got to believe his athleticism is, you know, he is a, is a nice piece. The bulls are going to be one of the five worst teams in the league. And there are at least five studs in this college draft coming up. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't watch much college basketball, but I've seen some of these guys. I mean, this dude who's at Arizona, Deandre, I don't even know how you say his last name. Aiton. Aiden, yeah. Uh, holy hell. Hey, the Mav, the Mavs might finally get a DeAndre. <laughs> you can always count on McMahon with these beautiful one liners. The Bulls are gonna have you know, the Bulls, you know, they gotta not screw up the draft pick. One year from today, they're gonna have three legitimate pieces to build around. And it doesn't mean that they're gonna work, but um, the, the Bulls have a method to what they're doing here. But to get there, they're going to have to take it, you know, in the teeth this year, kind of like Nico took it. And um, this is not something that you need. You're already going to be a bad team. You knew you were going to be a bad team from day one. And this is just a symptom of bad teams. That you just It just makes the whole organization look bad. 
this is this has been the storyline all season. It's kind of sad for the Bulls, uh, Brian, because you're right. All they wanted to do was have their terrible season, get their high draft pick, and and move along into the future. And this is the thing that the Bulls fans ask about constantly. But I, I'd add I'd add another piece quickly to to the end of the. Uh, the 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 future the rebuild conversation for the Bulls uh, the Bulls got absolutely destroyed in Chicago here uh, by a huge portion of their fan base and a lot of people around the league when they made the Jimmy Butler deal and I I didn't think it was that bad to begin with but I got to tell you having just been in Minneapolis and watched the Timberwolves a bunch uh, this year I just watched Jimmy score six points uh, in that win. Uh, they had the other night over the Spurs. And Jimmy's going to have a hell of a lot better nights than he had that night. Everybody's entitled to an off night here and there. But the Bulls are going to end up with Markinen, who I think we all agree can play, Levine, who can play, and we'll see what Chris Dunn turns into, although you know it, it didn't help him that as a point guard in this new era of the NBA, he can't shoot. Having said but, that, but, but the Bulls were going to be at best mediocre with Jimmy Butler, and so they, they stripped it down and 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 restarted. Jimmy, and, and, yeah, and, and and to Winnie's point of your point, the trade was you get a lottery pick you really like now. You get Levine, who you know is who knows when he'll play this year, but this year's about also the whole point of this year is to get another high lottery pick. Right. So in a way, you're getting two lottery picks and a guy who is is a young uh, recent lottery pick. But you know what, I, and, and I think the whole Bobby Portis uh, punch thing was, was really smart because the, the Bulls love Nick Friedle, and they knew they were losing him. So they had to give Nick some <laughs> kind of reason to, to hang around. So they come up with this drama. And, Good you know, job. Poor, Good poor job, Nico, Bulls. Poor Nico, again. you know, he had, he had to – he had to be the, the victim here, but they had to give uh, Nick a reason to, to be able to sleep in his own bed in Chicago and love up on those bulls. <laughs> Nick Nick has a beautiful place in downtown Chicago too. He's not wanting to be giving that up. Um, all right, uh, McMahon, I think you, I think it's almost time to board. Nick, thank you very much. We will uh, we got to have you back, man. You've, uh, see if you can get a player to say something else should be legalized. It's going to be it's going to be Fredell Fridays. He's going to take over the naming rights. No more Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> just knocked me right out of the box. Well, my wife is uh, nine months pregnant, so at any time I could get knocked out. So, um, where to go, Wendy? Uh, <laughs> um, all right, <laughs> thanks a lot, um, Mr. McMahon. Uh, have a safe trip back to Dallas, uh, Nick. I'll see you out there on the road. And thank you to Andrew Hahn, and thanks to all the listeners for listening with us at the Hoop Collective today. Before we get to KB and KP, here's a conversation with Brian Winhorst and Jody Avergan of the 30 for 30 podcast series. So I'm here with Jody Avergan. Um, uh, Jody, you run the ESPN 30 for 30 podcast, but what is like your official title? Uh, I think I'm host and senior producer, but we have a little team here, and we work with obviously the films folks. But um, but yes, that's my that's my yeah. title. And you work out of New York City, and I've been to your offices before, mm-hmm. and it's all very, very 2017 with common areas, and it's all very podcasty, <laughs> right? Yes, that, that's right. Uh, you know, sometimes I wish there were uh, a few more windows, but yes, we have a nice little space here. <laughs> Um, he works out of, uh, Andrew, uh, he works out of, um, this office in Lincoln center. That's like one of the best locations in New York. So don't feel bad for him. I'm yes. just going to put it that way. Um, 30 for 30, just put out, just started second season. Uh, if I'm not incorrect mm-hmm. and, um, uh, just put out a, a pod, um, about the photo, um, that, um, uh, that the Miami Heat took in 2012 after the Trayvon Martin killing. Um, and uh, it's called Hoodies Up. And, Jody, it's a, um, you know, the way, you, you know, you describe it is that it was sort of the beginning of an – at one point, I think it's being – it's sort of that photo is compared to uh, the Tommy Smith uh, photo from the 68 Olympics. Yeah. Um, 
um, you know, it's it's a sort of a, a, a deep dive into what was all surrounding what is now an iconic um, image, certainly of the last decade in the yeah. American sports culture. I mean, you know, so Wesley Morris, who used to write for Grantland and now writes for the New York Times Magazine, he's the one who says towards the end of the podcast that he thinks that this photo that the Heat took sits at the same table, as he put it, with uh, the 68 photo of Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Uh, you know, that's a big statement. And I, you know, to be honest, don't, maybe don't go all the way there with him. But I also think that uh, we didn't really get into this into the pod, in the podcast, but I also think that we're just living in an age where, like, no single kind of, like, piece of culture can have that big of an impact just because we move on so quickly. But as you said, I think our argument here and one of the things I was interested in exploring was whether this photo taken, you know, five years ago did – serve as a bit of an opening bracket on a new era of athlete activism, which we are clearly living in. I don't think anyone can argue with that, that athletes in a lot of different sports are taking political, social stands in a way that they weren't 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and I think this photo really did have a big, big part in that. It's not, I mean, it's, this seems sort of trivial when, when you look at the overall themes, but you place, a, there's a clip in the, in the pod uh, from PTI and, Tony mm -hmm. Kornheiser kind of points to it being a pivoting moment for LeBron James because, yeah. you know, th this is – so the Heat had already had um, their first year where they failed in the finals. LeBron tells everybody that, um, you know, they have to go back to their pathetic lives um, and don't make fun of him. And the Heat are not yet champions. They had not yet uh, – you know, they were playing well that year. Yeah. But they had not yet achieved anything, and, and the villainry, they were still living it, and this was the beginning of the pivot out of that. Um, and LeBron is seen completely differently now, five years yeah. later. I mean, to be perfectly honest, when I started reporting this, uh, I like was kind of thinking of it as, as a story where that wasn't going to be a big theme, where I was thinking, okay, you know, LeBron James is like, he's back in Cleveland, he's won some championships. I was just sort of thinking of him, and I was reminded over the course of reporting this that, oh, yeah, there was a time not that long ago when it was cool to kind of hate on LeBron James. And as Tony Kornheiser puts it in that clip, you know, he's, he's generally perceived of as a very selfish person. Uh, you know, I was just – I didn't have a dog in the fight in that 2011 final, so I was rooting for the Mavs. I think like a lot of sort of neutral observers were. Um, and – I don't know if this photo, I mean, I would love to hear what you think about this. I don't know if this photo kind of like 180 flipped the script on how we saw LeBron James. But I think for a lot of people, um, it landed and hit them and, and sort of said, oh, this guy is up to something else that's a little different from the narrative of the previous two years that had started with, with the decision. I'm the wrong person to ask about that because <laughs> I didn't really, like, I never really judged LeBron for right. going to Miami. And also... Um, you know, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, and the Miami Heat were tremendous influences on him. I mean, uh, I, you know, but, but I, this photo, so I was covering the Heat at that time for ESPN yeah. every day. I was in Detroit the day that it happened. Um, and so what I will say that the photo meant to me was um, I was living in Miami, okay? Yeah. I did not know about the Trayvon Martin killing when this happened, uh, even though it was being covered on the news networks, I, it was not in my world. Yeah. So, um, they had had shoot around in, um, in Detroit and Detroit's kind of a pain in the butt. It, well, not anymore. They moved downtown, but the hotel in Detroit is a long way from shoot around. Um, because they, the teams, uh, all, almost all stayed at this hotel in Birmingham, Michigan, which is like 25 boring minutes from the palace at Auburn Hills. And it was in February. I don't remember the weather, but I'm sure it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think I remember I saw a movie that day hmm. um, because, you know, there was really nothing else to do in Detroit uh, or not Detroit, not don't mean it's Detroit, but uh, up in Birmingham. So I come out of the movie and I saw this photo on Twitter and I'm like, I, I didn't know what they were. Like, you know, it said hashtag, you know, we're all, we're all Trayvon Martin or we are Trayvon Martin. Is that what it said, Jody? Yep, we are Trayvon, we are Trayvon yeah. Martin, yeah. I didn't know who Trayvon Martin was. Wow. Yeah. So um, uh, as far as awareness, it certainly brought awareness to me. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, and that's one of the things I think we were careful with um, in this piece. I th actually, one of the interesting themes is kind of like, 
what takes an issue to the sort of next level of awareness, because there were certain circles that were very aware of this story, you know, and, and there were news, news, there was news coverage and stuff, but, you know, we talked to a couple of activists who were involved with this story and they said that this photo really took it and made it a cultural story and took it to another level. And I think that that, you know, I, I don't think we're trying to argue that the, the heat were responsible for, you know, uh, publicizing the Trayvon Martin story. I mean, the same day, as you heard in the podcast, the same day that they s- sent this photo, President Obama talked about it in the Oval Office. So there were kind of, there was this awareness growing on all these different fronts at the same time, which is, I think, how movements happen. It's not like one person is responsible for taking one stand and sort of all of a sudden, you know, the tide shifts. I think it's that all of this stuff happens in concert. But the fact that the Heat were willing to take this stand is both, they were taking a stand and sort of raising awareness, but also it had gotten to a point where they felt comfortable, frankly, uh, taking this stand. Yeah. And, you know, nowadays, um, LeBron speaks about social issues as a matter yeah. of regular course. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to spend the afternoon uh, educating myself because when I went over to the arena that night, I had to ask questions about mm-hmm. what this yeah. was. You know, now, I mean, like I said, we LeBron spent 45 minutes at his introductory press conference or, you know, in, initial press conference this year at Media Day talking about political matters. Yeah. And I mean, it, it was a it was a, a remarkable press conference, but it wasn't out of the norm. So now it's part of the norm. But the other thing that happened um, a couple of weeks after that event in Detroit, um, Dwayne Wade's cousin uh, or no, his nephew, his nephew um, was shot in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And um, that was also an awareness moment for me because um, I remember that the yeah, the Heat played in Chicago a few weeks later, and um, you know Dwayne had gone and visited his his nephew survived. Um, Dwayne had gone and visited him, and I went to go back and find the story. On the Chicago, I, I needed to go back to get more information. I went to the Chicago Tribune's website, and just in like the ten days between when it happened and when the, the Heat had come to town and, and Dwayne was gonna uh, go see him, like there had been like a dozen more shootings in the yeah. South Side of Chicago, and I, I was blown away. Like I knew that it was bad, but I didn't realize that to go back ten days to find a story on a shooting that you had to scroll through 10 other stories. And yeah. so that was an awareness moment as well. And, and Dwayne used that time. And then a very terribly, unfortunately, a cousin, a different cousin hmm. um, last year um, uh, was shot and killed in crossfire in the South side of Chicago, you know, four years later. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's part of this story too. I think that, it's just an, another reminder that I think we sometimes need that these are, you know, real human beings with families um, and they're touched by violence in the way that, you know, a lot of us are touched by violence and they're doing a lot of stuff that's out of the public eye, but then they're also taking stands that are in the public eye and they're listening to, you know, one of my favorite parts of this story is that we trace kind of how the photo came to be and we realize it went from activist circles through Gabrielle Union, who was who's an actress who was Dwayne Wade's Girlfriend at the time. Uh, Everybody on this pod knows who Gabrielle, who Gabrielle Union is. Union is. We've actually had a number of debates uh, in our office about whether she's more famous than Dwayne Wade or, or not. Uh, but anyway, Gabrielle Union, you know, really was the one who kind of sat down with Dwayne and said, like, there's been this killing. Uh, we need to you need to take a stand and you need to talk to LeBron and you need to talk to UD, Donna Taslam, and you guys need to do this. And that and I just really, um, you know, kind of like that we are able to to show her agency in this and also just show how these things come together and that these superstars are real human beings with spouses and families and they're having these kinds of conversations day in and day out. Yeah, and uh, so you you get all the principles too. You, you yeah. Gabrielle talks to you. Uh, I mean, I just call her Gab. She and I yeah, are, you know, good. buddies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just tease. Um, you get Dwayne, uh, LeBron, Udonis. They all sat for interviews um, yeah. for this. Obviously, it's hard to get LeBron to give a specialized interview for anything. I know this uh, all too well. So he had to feel like he wanted to tell his story to be a part of this, I would assume. I think so. I mean, we worked this for a long time. So I was, you know, very, very dogged and persistent to try and get him but i also knew that 
because of what we're doing here, which is, you know, podcasts, uh, you know, audio only, you don't show up with a big sort of rig, you don't show up with lights. And, you know, that I was hoping that we could push them into a sort of different space to open up a little bit more, not just because of the subject matter, but because of the medium. I think that's an advantage we have. But, you know, I worked the LeBron angles for five, six months and then finally got a call last spring. I think it was right between their first during the playoffs between their first round series, which I don't know who they beat, but then second round series was with the Raptors maybe. And yeah. I got a call on like a Saturday, you know, a day off in between and said, you know, when can you get to Cleveland? Or maybe it was, can you get to Cleveland tomorrow? And so I said, absolutely. I like literally had a LeBron go bag, like sitting by <laughs> for five months waiting for the call. I've had a LeBron go bag for 15 for, years. Jerry. Exactly. Exactly. And so I booked the flight the next morning, flew out to Cleveland, you know, took a cab to the practice facility, a, a, a drill I'm, very, I'm sure you're very familiar with, went and sat in uh, the media room, which is right next to the practice room. They were having practice in the room next door. And I sat there for about an hour and a half and then a door swings open and LeBron just like jogs in. They were practicing. Clearly they were just like, okay, the team's going to do this drill and LeBron's going to go talk about this. Yeah. Story. You know, the, 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 the LeBron, and, yeah. Yeah. LeBron is swept to the first round of the playoffs, like six years yes. in a row. So they're, they're, they're used to having like eight days off between exactly. rounds. It's definitely yeah. a good time to, to, yeah. to get and them. So, yeah, you've probably seen this too, but one of the things I was impressed by was, his ability to just like switch gears and switch focus. And it was just a reminder that like these guys have so many things going on in their lives. And and also part of being a good athlete, I think is mental toughness and the ability to kind of like quickly switch your focus and give everything your full attention. But, you know, he came from a practice and within seconds, I thought, you know, was pretty like locked in and able to sort of give pretty thoughtful answers um and just switch gears and i just asked my first question we were off to the races and i got like 13 minutes with him and then he went back to practice and i went back to new york but it was um you know i think that having the the principles here were really was really important so um let me ask you this Mm -hmm. do you did you ever find out who actually took the the, took that photo because the photo is beautifully framed yeah it's like beautifully lit i don't you know i don't know if back in 2012 we had as many filters as we do on our phones now um it's in the townsend hotel which is um you know a very ornate hotel um in in birmingham michigan it's one of the nicer hotels probably in the state of michigan so it was in a very nice ballroom and it had like you know beautiful like gold leaf um uh like wallpaper or whatever but do you ever do you know who took the photo i'd I'd love to know that yeah, I wanted so there's a moment in there where um Joel uh we talked to Joel Anthony as well who was on that team and he's and I asked him I, mean, I asked everyone for like as much detail as possible you know where were you who took the photo who decided where how you were going to stand uh you know I like those sort of deep details no one could remember who actually wow. took the photo but I think it was someone on the coaching staff and then they somehow got it to LeBron there was a there's a piece if you if you're interested in this minutia there's a piece that didn't there's a clip that didn't make it into the final but where Dwayne Wade says, after they took the photo, he got it onto his phone, and then he just kind of casually says, and we sent it to, I sent it to my team, and LeBron sent it to his <laughs> team, and they <laughs> put it out, which was a really interesting kind of revelation that, at that right. point at least, they kind of had, like, social media handlers, and now, yeah. clearly, like, those guys are just doing it directly. Uh, and I think that that actually is a nice reminder that in 2012, Twitter was this thing that, like, was managed by your PR folks. And now it's just like sitting on your phone and it's the way to communicate directly. But I love that moment where he reveals <laughs> that like he got someone else to actually post the photo. Worry, I mean, this sounds stupid because yes. these are podcast listeners listening to this, but I will follow the, the accepted orders of the, uh-huh. uh, of the, of the, you know, the deal. Um, where do you, where, where Jody, do you get the 30 for 30 podcast? Well, what you do is you, um, you come over to my house and I'll just play it for you. <laughs> okay, cool. That's the only way to get it. No, uh, we're you can go to thirty for thirty podcast dot com. But we are, you know, we're wherever you get your podcast. So wherever you're listening to this, whatever, whatever app you're listening to this in, if it's the ESPN app, will be there. If it's uh, Apple Podcasts, will be there. But if you go to thirty for thirty podcast dot com, you can either stream it there or find all sorts of links to our first episode. And and this is season two is off to the races. So we have four more. So are you revealing what the, what some of these other ones yeah. are or do you, go ahead? Yeah, no, it's out there. I mean, the topics are out there. Um, so we, we've got, it's actually pretty fun. We've got a nice mix of 
stories and a lot of big names. So next next episode we're do, is um, about UFC one, the very first UFC where it was literally just like what would happen if a sumo wrestler fought a karate guy and they just like, put him in a in a cage and they, they did it. Uh, and that one's really fun and weird and, and interesting. We have a story about Wrigley Field and how there was like basically a 40 year fight to install lights at Wrigley Field. They were the last stadium to install lights. I um, remember the, yeah. the day they did. I remember watching it. Do you remember what day it was? Very memorable. <sighs> eight 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 eight. Uh, Is that they did it in the like in the middle of? The, it was they didn't do it till August of the yeah. season. Yeah, they waited till eight eight eighty eight. Uh, to install them and do it. And then, so I don't know stupid. if this is, a, this is a giveaway, but it, it ended up being a rain out, which I just love. So, <laughs> I don't remember that, no. Just got basically saying, like, no, you don't get to play it. <laughs> and they had to finish the first night game the next day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, So that's a really fun story. Um, and we actually have the former announcer for the Cubs uh, narrating it, which is really good. Uh, and then we have a story about John Madden, uh, the video game, and the kind of, like, early days of... Ah, uh, that was definitely my era. That was definitely yeah. my era. Yeah, and there's some good history there. And then our final one is about, I don't know if, you, if the name Felix Baumgartner rings a bell, but he's the guy who did all those Red Bull stunts, including the one where he went like many, many miles into space and jumped. He jumped out of the balloon. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we have the story of kind of, we actually sort of tell the story right up until the moment that he jumps because there was just a lot, um, and I won't give away too much, but there was a lot that, it took to get him to that moment as you can imagine and so we kind of got all the access and got all of them to talk about the sort of putting it together all right jody well thanks a lot for uh for coming on and letting us know about it and uh Great. you can check it out the 30 look you can just search 30 for 30 and you'll yeah. get you'll get it you don't even have to put in their stuff in but all right thanks jody take care thanks brian take care AB and KP starts right now. Pelton, you have uh, you have a question that you've been sitting on for a couple of weeks now, right? Yeah, I tried to ask this last week, but we had already gone too long. Okay, so this is a, a Chuck Klosterman hypothetical that comes from Chuck Klosterman 4, uh, one of his compilation books. Uh, assume everything about your musical taste was reversed overnight. Everything you once loved, you now hate. Everything you once hated, you now love. For example, if your favorite band has always been R.E.M., they will suddenly sound awful to you. They will become the band you dislike the most. M.E.R. By this... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nice. By the same token, if you've never been remotely interested in the work of Yes or Jethro Tull, those two groups will instantly seem fascinating. If you generally dislike jazz today, you'll generally like jazz tomorrow. If you generally consider the first album by Veruca Salt to be slightly above average, you will abruptly find it to be slightly below average. Everything will become its opposite, but everything will remain in balance and the rest of your personality will remain unchanged. So... In all likelihood, you won't love music any less or any more than you do right now. There will be artists you love and who make you happy. They will merely be all the artists you currently find unlistenable. Now, I concede that this transformation would make you unhappy, but explain why. Hmm. You're essentially telling someone to become the inverse of their own musical tastes? Yes. And to say that the inverse is equal is not the same opposite but not equal so here, here's the thought i have after having ruminated for the past decade on this hypothetical uh oh, is <laughs> is is that uh part of it is because of the fact that our tastes help define who we are as people right. and then we also choose people to surround us based on the fact that they generally have similar tastes so Probably odds are if you like a certain type of music, your friends like that type of music generally, and they dislike the type of music you dislike. And all of a sudden, you're going to be a huge outlier if everything about your personality changes, which gets to a more general point, which is that like, by liking or disliking things, we're constantly defining our own personality. And that also applies to how we feel about basketball.
Interesting. I I feel like whoever came up with this just hot boxed an entire Walmart. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. that is that is a very accurate de- depiction of Chuck Colsterman. Is it? Yes, it, yes, it oh, is. That's great. Hi, Chuck. Um, I don't know. I guess this gets it like, you know, like the the problem of genius. I guess. Yeah. In, in what sense? Like if if you are someone who likes i mean i guess if you take it in the general sense like if there's something that's that's generally not liked and then all of a sudden overnight i mean you're saying in social groups but i'm saying in a in society yeah there's something that is not liked and you happen to like it or happen to create it that i guess is what genius is I, I think that's what a hipster is is this a kanye reference <laughs> oh good point Con- kanye is a great one that we could get into so the reason i thought about this last week is because we were talking about how kb you i don't know if you actually feel this way but you were raising the idea that people would be unhappy if their friends weren't consistent in their behavior even right. if it was actually something behavior they liked better hypothetically. And so that's sort of what also happens here is you've got this huge disconnect in the consistency of what you like. Huh. I, so, but you do have memory of liking the other thing? Yes. Okay. Got it. Hmm. But what does that look like generally? I think that's where I'm most interested. Isn't, is, wouldn't like a real world application of this be for most people from high school when they go to college, for example, and they are yes. one way with a group of people and then they're able to completely reinvent themselves in a new environment and go in a completely different direction. Well, that gets us an yeah. inter- inter- interesting area, which is, are either those your, quote, real personality or is there such a thing or is it all situational? Right. I guess uh, the, the way you receive art or receive concepts, like if I keep going general, I, I'm assuming that's not really what the exercise is about, but when have I ever cared? But I think if you take it in terms of like the the regular population and then like someone, a genius or like a literary genius or a musical genius or like Einstein or I don't know, you, I guess you tend to like or enjoy or explore patterns that other people don't and find off-putting actually. So it's funny because I always say, if you want to figure out how smart someone really is, don't hand them a packet of math problems, but rather ask their opinion on some controversial piece of real art. Like, uh, like Lolita is a good example. And we're like, will the person have an automatic aversion to it because it deals with the subject of pedophilia and call it a nasty book and wrongly ascribe to the author some sort of dreadful Freudian diagnosis of his own. There's like a lot of literists uh, literists, literalists out there who think that you can't write a book like that without being a secret pervert yourself. Like we have this established idea that makes us have this natural aversion to something like that. I don't but, know. I feel I feel like some events of the past week have. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that <laughs> or will they take on like a like the challenge of the actual literature? Because great art is bi-directionally difficult, meaning for both the author and the reader. And if you realize that, then you can enjoy the art of a controversial book and realize that the book is far from anti-moral, if we're speaking of Lolita, and it's actually fiercely moral. I think there's a lot of people that would rather grasp onto the general idea of this is a perverted book, this is disgusting, this should be on the banned list, it's not... You know, you just have this this concept of a book that's not really enjoying the book. A real artist or a consumer of art, like a real genius, will reveal some sort of mechanism of the, I guess, I guess wonderful toy that is literature, right? Like, meaning you, know, you don't read for some infantile purpose of identifying with characters and you don't do it for some teenage purpose of learning to live and not for some academic purpose of indulging in some sort of generalization, which a lot of authors uh, of novels tend to do. Uh, But a real consumer that's ready to embrace difficult art reads or writes for the sake of form and their visions of that art. And a real uh, uh, 
I guess, consumer genius of genius work does not share the emotions of the people of the book, like not of the characters, but rather of the author of the book and the joys and difficulties of the creation of the book, because then you are truly enjoying genius. And I think a lot of people, like if we take this concept generally, would rather go with the general idea of how like everyone else feels about a certain topic. And then if theirs is the one outlier, um, even if it is a, um, I guess, evolved form of uh, experiencing art, it is still an outlier. And that makes you feel not good. Like, hasn't that happened to you? Like, you've ne- you've felt like you've had maybe even a better idea than everyone else, but it's just different, and therefore you don't like it, or you have a f- bad feeling about yourself, maybe, because you feel excluded? Hmm. I don't know. I'd say I feel, like, defiant often when that's the case, as mm. opposed to excluded. So does that make you feel happy or unhappy? I'm kind of a consensus builder by nature, so it probably makes me a little bit unhappy, but I'm okay with it. Han? Uh, Mostly I was just thinking about how we are so quick to try and pin down these players that come into the league with specific thoughts or opinions or ideas and almost in an attempt to try and uh, catch them in some kind of uh, contradiction. Uh, and that's got to be incredibly frustrating for people mm. that are on a much more accelerated development cycle, whether they're ready for it or not. Yeah. 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 And especially then in a society where because of social media, so many of our thoughts have been recorded from such a young age. Ugh, that gives me anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, true. I mean, what you were saying, Han, sort of reminded me of like there's this Bill James theory that uh, – Basically, whenever a young player comes into the league, we ascribe to them this, you know, if they're very successful, we ascribe to them this moral, these great morals as well to go with it. And then basically set ourselves up for disappointment when we're revealed that they are, in fact, all too human. I think that, like, in baseball, Alex Rodriguez was a great example of this, although he's enjoyed this weird renaissance now is a uh as a commentator on fox and then also just general all around i don't i don't know how i would describe what a, what it is a rod is doing as a businessman now but uh and on and on instagram and social media but whatever he's doing it's fascinating he's doing j-lo <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's as good of an example of that in basketball, but I'm sure that the same tendency holds, partially because of the fact that we want to think that if someone is really superior athletically, that they're also superior morally somehow. Yes, mm. yes. It feels like like fans feel like those things are inextricably linked, and they're not. Yeah, and it gets to the whole sense of like sport is a way to reveal your underlying character, which, you know, was responsible for a lot of the growth of sports back during the, uh, what, like the YMCA days. And it was, you know, considered part of, you know, your, your moral development was to develop yourself physically as well as mentally. But then also the whole Obama thing of like, before, you know, before you get to know anyone, you want to play basketball with them. Ooh. Wait, what's that's that? That's interesting. Like, like, you know, his, his brother-in-law, who was the former coach at uh, Oregon State, Craig Robinson, is now in the Knicks organization after working for the Bucks. like famously played basketball with Obama but to kind of test whether he was good enough for Michelle. Oh, okay. And on the one hand, it's kind of like fascinating. But on the other hand, I wonder about, you know, is there someone who could be just a total jerk on the basketball court, but like this great person in real life? That is an interesting thought. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, so the other thought I had is that made me think of LeBron. And like, so for a while, LeBron got treated like a villain because of the, 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 the decision and going to Miami and forming a super team. And for a while, he was like trying to embrace that and be the villain. And I think I kind of saw like the high point of it, which was his overtime game that he won in Portland that first year where he was really like playing to the crowd like a wrestling heel. And then it turned out, but and I guess the culmination of it then was his quotes after they lost the 2011 finals about like, you know, your life is still going to be the same, even though I lost, even though you're happy now. 
Uh, but then after that, he seemed to realize that, like, look, this is not who I am. I'm not a villain and kind of didn't try to put try to put himself in that role that everyone else put him in because it wasn't who he was authentically. Right. That's actually really interesting. Do you think that has anything to do with change of atmosphere? Like his different his different um, like when he came back to Cleveland, is he a hero or is he a villain? Because a lot of people, I think, still. Even today, like with the recent stuff now, I think paint him as a villain. In terms of his political commentary? Oh, no. Oh. Like with the potential of him leaving again? Um, No, like, you know, I've, some people would say he picks on Kyrie or he's bitter and he's... Um, <laughs> uh, Daddy LeBron? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who's who's the real LeBron and who's Daddy LeBron? <laughs> well, yeah, he's gotten much older. I think he has grown into. He may have authentically grown into Daddy LeBron. Yeah, I mean, but it gets to that idea of who the world sees you as. You sort of are going to think you are that ooh, person. Ooh, ooh. Do you become the villain? Like once the superhero, like LeBron or like a Michael Jordan, starts to lose a little bit and that's i mean i think he looks great for his age i think he's doing really well i think he's not really falling off any cliff really but if once once the super hero starts to kind of feel the effects of age does he then turn himself into the villain or does he turn himself into the father superhero and what does that say about the superhero in the first place yeah, I mean, I think the one thing you commonly see with NBA players as they age is their don't give a ah. fuckness goes off the charts. Ooh, like, bleep it. Yeah, uh, Kobe in particular is like the uh, the great example of that, right? Where yes. he started started cursing all the time and saying what he really thought. And it turned out that he had this very interesting, perhaps still somewhat calculated personality that was very different than when he was basically trying to pretend to be Michael Jordan during his younger years. Oh, I love Kevin's Kevin's um always Kobe shade. <laughs> always there. I love it actually. No, I th- I find like grown up DJAF Kobe very fascinating. <laughs> DJAF Kobe, you learned from your first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want, like one one bleep through Han was enough. <laughs> Isn't that what it sounds like? Uh, it sounds like quack quack. Oh. When you say the F word, it's a, it's a quack quack. When you say something uh, else, it's like a meh. Oh. Yeah. <sighs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted it. Just making more work. You know, so, wait, so if, if we take this one more thing with this concept that we originally were talking about. Okay, so we superimpose that over basketball. Like, let's move away from players and talk about coaches remember when we got the question like a week ago or was it a week ago yeah about tips Maybe it was earlier this week oh yeah about tips yeah like is he a genius or is he not the people do we do we see them as like how do we how what is our concept of basketball genius and like what makes is it because okay i th- what makes us special as human beings right is being aware of being aware of being so in other words if I not only know that I am, but I also know that I know it, then I belong to the human species and all the rest follow. So like the glory of thought and poetry and like a vision of the universe. And in that respect, the gap between an ape and a man is totally greater than the one between the amoeba and the ape. So the stupidest person in the world by this definition is like an all around genius compared to the most or the cleverest computer, not most clever. That's actually grammatically incorrect. How, so how we, how we learn is just fascinating to me, right? Like to imagine and express things is this riddle with premises impossible to express and also a solution that's impossible to imagine. So I think there exists genius in forms of creativity and art and innovation, even in like sports. And we talk about Tibbs or like, um, like pop and his playbooks and all of that, that maybe a general audience may not be ready to experience. And maybe in basketball that translates to um, may not be ready to counter or um, deal with. And, you know, perhaps in other realms that they never would be, there are certain teams that will never be able to match what they have to offer. But uh, 
if you think of like a, a true genius, a genius, I guess, can be thought of as like the Algerian man who dreams up a winter snow, right? So meaning one who imagines that one who imagines what has not yet been and what is not yet imagined. That is to experience genius. So one cannot imagine what, what cannot, what one cannot compare to anything, but when one does, that is the definition of a genius. It is not like a solvable math problem per se, but rather the unsolved math theory. So genius lies in the birth of the concept, not in in any of its mechanical reproductions. So the genius sees the facts of the culture or a basketball world or like the court or whatever, the so-called facts of the world, the so-called facts of the court as like farcical and fraudulent in a way. They're always malleable and liquid for a genius and hard stone for a common man or like a common coach. So if we think about it like that, where many coaches see the court, see their players as these fixed in stone mm, pieces with a fixed in stone thing, then I guess the real genius is the one that sees those all as liquid, right? Like the one who can come up with something that is not um, contained within what everyone else is. So this sounds like you're saying Mike D'Antoni. Right, right. That's a perfect example. So then right now in the league, let's say besides Pop or D'Antoni, do we, do we see flashes of genius anywhere? Like maybe not, they're not a full-blown, you know, it's not like D'Antoni yet. It's not like pop yet but do we see flashes of it anywhere that could that maybe hint at that happening i mean maybe what the pelicans are doing with demarcus cousins and anthony davis and using those guys as guards essentially but that's still i think within you know it's subverting the normal way big men are used but it's it's still part of a general pattern towards it as opposed to being a completely new thing Right. And ge- well, genius also has to be effective, right? So like you can yeah. write, you know, like a crazy book with all this crap, but it can still be a bad book. And you can have a come up with like a technically, I guess, like a theory in math or science or whatever. But I mean, none of your facts can be correct. Hello, Kyrie. How are you? <laughs> I, if you're listening, cool theory. Um, well, this, this, by the way, to go back to your original point, though, it does make me think of my favorite Tibbs quote which is the magic is in the work. Like it really irks me when people call Rick Carlisle or some other coach a quote wizard because that to me both it gives them too much power because the players still have to go out and and execute but it also in some ways gives them too little credit because of the fact that it's not a magical power. The magic is that they've worked really hard and been creative and come up with solutions to make their players as effective as possible. Right. I think... uh... I think the big takeaway from all of this is that Kevin Pelton pronounces execute as execute. I was just thinking that. <laughs> I was like, wow, that was okay. No one's going to say anything cool. <laughs> um, execute. Execute. It's Ex- like, it's like he, it's like he got one of those like teacher packs of stickers with like eggs. And it's like, <laughs> that was an excellent answer. <laughs> nice execution on this math problem. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll be back to take your questions next week on Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Use the hashtag KBKP. Get them in early. Don't just wait till the end like all of us who procrastinate. Yeah, hit them with the hashtag. Hit them with the hashtag. The magic is in the work. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I'm so happy, I feel like I can fly. Disclaimer, you will not be able to fly by switching to Geico. This is against the laws of physics and nature. If you find yourself flying, please seek professional and or medical help immediately. In the unlikely event you find yourself flying, you might be a superhero or a pigeon or a superhero named Pidge Woman who was bitten by a radioactive pigeon. If you are indeed Pidge Woman, Geico retains all licensing publishing rights in the event Pidge Woman the movie becomes a top-grossing Hollywood blockbuster. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.